Um, but it's a, you know, it's been a wonderful time for me since I've been here, and I only see the amazing um, opportunities amidst the challenges looking forward and feel so grateful to have a room full of people that are going to help us in every way and be successful in your own lives, in your own endeavors. So thank you. Late. Were we going to do any, I'm not sure if we were doing any questions now, Nadine, or are we just going to go straight to the panel? Do you, okay, after the panel. Okay, great. I'll be back. Thanks. Please welcome back Nadine Watt. I am joyful. I hope you are all joyful. I see and feel the joy. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, President Fult. That was amazing, inspiring. Every time I hear you speak, I get excited about all the life-changing work being done at USC, work that is building a better tomorrow for everyone. That said, there are still steep barriers to overcome, particularly with regard to leadership and representation. Racism, sexism, homophobia, economic inequality, these are just a few of the lingering obstacles to diversity, equity, and inclusion that persist to this day. Nevertheless, progress is being made. More seats are being added to the table. In a minute, President Folt will rejoin us to discuss the necessity of diverse representation and leadership with two university trustees. Former USC trustee John Eno, who is currently serving as the Interim Associate Senior Vice President for Alumni Relations, will serve as the moderator for this discussion. It's now my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Please hold your applause until they get up here and sit down. Maybe I get a picture with them, I don't know. Um, John Eno is a longtime champion of issues related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. John is past president of the USC Alumni Association Board of Governors, as well as my good friend and trusted advisor. As an interim associate senior vice president for alumni relations, John is helping to develop a new strategic plan to chart the USC Alumni Association's future. It may have taken a little bit of convincing for President Folt to pull John out of retirement, but we couldn't be more grateful he decided to trade in his tea time on the green for a desk chair at his alma mater. Welcome, John. In 20, welcome, John. In 2022, Suzanne Nora Johnson made university history when she became the first woman to chair the USC Board of Trustees. She has served on the board since 1998, with my grandfather, as a matter of fact. So, a proud USC Dornsife alum, Suzanne achieved great success in the traditionally male-dominated world of Wall Street. She served as the vice chair of Goldman Sachs, as well as the chair of the firm's Global Markets Institute. Her professional success was recognized by Forbes in 2006 when the magazine named her one of the world's 100 most powerful women. Powerful stage. And finally, please join me in welcoming back our illustrious leader and rock star, Dr. Carol Folt. Well, good morning, everyone. So today, we're in for a real treat. Um, you know, I personally am honored to share the stage today with these, the, actually the top two leaders at USC, uh, our president and our board chair. And I really can't think of another university in, in, in the nation that has women in the top two positions. So women are leading this university. You know, we've come a long way. And, um, you know, I'm really privileged to be the token male on today's panel. <laughs> so, Special time, um, did you know in 2023, over 75 million women were employed in the United States? So it's way past the time that we see gender parity in our boardrooms, in our C-suites, in our corner offices. And in fact, the world really should follow the example set by USC. So I'm the former chief diversity officer of a global law firm, and I know how crucial it is that women have a seat at the table. In fact, uh, during my term as the president of the Alumni Association Board of Governors, I was privileged to be able to appoint people to the board. 
And during my first term as president, for the first time in USC history, we had gender parity on our Board of Governors. And then this, thank you. And then in the second year, we had a majority women on our board. <laughs> so we, we can do this. We can really do this. And our guests today, our speakers today, certainly are leading the way. Our board chairs, Suzanne Nora Johnson and Carol Folt, you know, they really bring compassion and vision to the tough task of leadership. And I've seen it firsthand. They understand that we need everyone's talent now more than ever. Now more than ever. So with that, let's go. Or as my kids like to say, let's go. <laughs> okay. Let me ask the both of you and set the stage here. Um, could each of you share what you think are the most important attributes of leadership? Mrs. I'll start with you. So, John, I'm, I'm going to ask you a favor. I'm going to interrupt. Um, it is staff appreciation today, and there is a very special woman that works in the president's office who serves as chief of staff for the chair. Um, she's been at Disney. She's been at the FBI. We are now lucky to have her at USC. Her name is Elise Levine. It is her birthday today. Um, and, and she's sitting in the audience. And I would hope, because I cannot sing, but I'm hoping that you will all join me in singing happy birthday. So one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Elise. Happy birthday to you. So Carol said it at the beginning uh, that it's Staff Appreciation Day, and, and we really are extraordinarily blessed to have just extraordinary talent. And Elise, as you've heard, is one of them who chose to come to us. So thank you, Elise. So your question, what are the most important uh, uh, attributes of leadership? Recognizing your team. <laughs> um, uh, I think really empathy, if I had to tell you, I think is the most extraordinary and important attribute. Uh, because understanding people of where they are, where they've come from, and most importantly, where they can go, um, I think is singularly uh, the most important. Um, and the second is, I would say, selflessness uh, and having a mentality of we versus me. Uh, because the best leaders really are all about service and serving others. Um, and the more they think in we terms as opposed to me terms, the more impactful they are. No, absolutely, absolutely. Carol? Um, I agree with both of those, so I'll add a couple others. You know, I mean, you have to be authentic, and that's part of empathy, but, you know, they're all, leaders come in all sizes, shapes, they have all different accents and things like that, and if they really are the real person that shows up, that is really important. And I think it's been something that a lot of women, in a way, needed to learn because we didn't have any models that looked like us. You know, I always tell funny stories about people, why they told me I could never be a university president because I didn't look like one. I mean, just lots of that kind of undermining of people's own belief in themselves. But when you start realizing your authentic self is what makes you a unique leader, you get to be you in a way that is really important to show up, I think that becomes partly how your job becomes more joyful because you're not trying to pretend to be somebody else. You get to be yourself, and then you fight very hard to do it well. So I think that authenticity is one. And I do think you want to lead by being able to inspire people. Now, that inspiration doesn't have to be about you, but you need to understand deeply a shared mission and a shared purpose that we're doing it with excellence, because people really want to be doing it for a purpose. So if you're able to get that from people and be consistent to that higher calling, authentic, empathetic, that then you have a much better job, too, because it's, you're, you're playing into the things that really matter to you as well. Yeah, now, now more than ever. And you know, when, you, when you, you know, it comes from within, it just radiates out, outward, and everyone can see that. 
So let me ask um, Suzanne a question. So we know that you led the search that uh, led us to Dr. Folt as our president. So what were some of the factors you considered during the search? And was there a specific interest in picking a woman leader? And what led to Carol being the choice? Great question. Um, um, the first thing I would say is, just on, on your second question, is I think that the committee believed in a level playing field, I think which was the most important, which meant that anybody, whether they were a man, a woman, a person of color, a person with a disability, whatever the issue was, that was not gonna be an issue. And we were gonna judge ourselves of making sure that the last group that we looked at was in fact a level playing field, that it was representative of lots of different identities um, in the world today. And so again, it wasn't specifically saying we're gonna have a woman or we're gonna have a woman that's uh, black or a woman that uh, has this or that, uh, but it really was, do we have a very robust slate? Uh, and I think that's the way uh, we operate generally as a university, is that it's a robust slate. Coming off of um, the scandals that Carol alluded to before, I think what we really wanted was a leader that we thought first and foremost could have the values uh, that would really represent the best of the Trojan family uh, and really would help to work to reinstitute and revitalize and execute those values. And um, Carol, as you know, kind of followed uh, Wanda Austin, who had a year as an interim, and, and Wanda, I think, did a very good job of stabilizing and trying to kind of really get us back on the path. Uh, but Wanda knew that was a kind of a one-year job, and you can't do that in one year. Um, to stabilize and to really bring the values back uh, is a multi-year journey. And we really believed that Carol's um, service, both at Dartmouth but also at UNC, um, had been an extraordinary testament um, to her ability to kind of both identify the values that were most important and to kind of live them and execute them. I also think that we were, wanted to have someone that we thought had really academic credibility and stature. Um, as many of you may know, um, in the middle of the scandal, much of our faculty was disillusioned, not just um, students and not just staff and not just alums, uh, but the faculty also were disillusioned. So we wanted to say, who is someone who we also think uh, could represent uh, the best of it? And then finally, I'd say we really wanted someone that we thought would understand an organization of this scale. Uh, because about half of USC is medical, uh, and about half of it uh, is kind of more traditional, what you all would think of university. There aren't that many people out there who have run organizations of scale or that have the multidisciplinarity that we do. And so Carol uh, kind of really was the top of the list, uh, kind of in meeting all of those specs. Yeah, and let me just say, in the time we since since, since then, has that has it really played out in that not only all, you know Carol's vision for what we were trying to achieve, but all the personal qualities that just come through uh, each and every day. And it's just so fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. My goodness. <laughs> So let me turn the tables a little bit and Carol ask you. So um, you were part of the group of the Board of Trustees that chose Suzanne as our board chair when Rick Caruso uh, decided to run for mayor. So what were the factors you considered at that time and why was it important to have Suzanne in this role? Oh, that's so great. Ha ha, Suzanne. Now you have to listen to me say good things about you because she never Damn, let John. us do that. <laughs> do it to you too, John. Um, no, but that is such a... Okay, so for a, a president, it's really important that you have a chair that you can... I'm going to say first, you have to have a chair you respect. You have to have a chair you can work with. It's particularly wonderful when you also like each other and can have fun together, but the really the most important things is that these two positions have to be able to both balance each other, trust each other. We're not gonna agree on everything. We have to be able to bring that forward. So those are so important. And if you don't trust, if the board chair doesn't trust the president, I mean, you're seeing this play out right now in the world. It's a disaster. Yet if you are gonna go and make change and do things well, that incredible trust is so important. I have immense trust for Suzanne, and I had seen it. We'd worked on some tough things 
in the uh, early years, and I thought, here's a person who has also had immense experience in many different types of organizations, has seen what can happen, what needs to be done, because that was so important. So that being able to trust in a partner, really important. Be able to have a shared sense of purpose. Um, you know, we talk about the university, but I care so deeply about students, and so does Suzanne when she talks about her own experience with JEP. I mean, to me, that's almost icing on the cake, because you have to be outstanding, have that trust and values. But then, when you find out that you've done all these things and we, we have all that that we really like to do together, it's important. And uh, Suzanne's, uh, I'm going to say, ambitious in that you want to get things done. You're not a person that says, oh, it'll take a couple years. <laughs> that's not the way she goes. Does not rock that way. But that's important because, you know, we want to achieve things with pace and, and certainty, and we need to do it together with the board. So those were all really important. And you had such immense trust of everyone on the board. And I think that's been fantastic for us. Thank you. And Carol, let me just follow up as, as well. So you've worked with other board chairs. Uh, in your role as president, other universities, and how has it been different working with Suzanne from your previous chair, board chairs? You know, partly it's different because I'm more experienced. You know, I think a president actually has to learn how to have a boss, or I mean, we don't think about it as a boss, but the board does hire and fire me. You know, and yet we're pretty independent. <laughs> We're independent people, you know, we think we run the university. So I think every relationship evolves when you start to really understand what is a positive board president relationship. You know, I was in a public university and it's a very different circumstance because I have nothing to do as a public chancellor of picking the board, who's on the board, or anything. And my first board chair actually helped hire me. It was wonderful. But once that started all changing, you didn't even know if you had a relationship with the board. So that is a very different world, different skills. And at Dartmouth, it was different too because I moved up through the ranks. So my board actually saw me first as an assistant professor, then this, 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 this. And when I was asked to serve as the interim president, I actually said, yes, but I'm not going to try to be the president. Because I felt at that point, I had a whole series of relationships with them, but you need a president sometimes to come in and get a fresh relationship with the board. So each circumstance has been different. This is certainly, for me, uh, a very joyful uh, relationship. Fantastic. Joy amongst chaos, <laughs> amidst chaos. Um, so let me ask the both of you, um, in the context of leadership, uh, we know that it's paramount to have diverse representation, as evidenced by our board, our leadership here. Um, so as a leader, how do you create that unity, that unified community, when you know you have diverse stakeholders? Let me start with Suzanne. Um, so, so I think that's very, very important, the unity. Uh, because really, um, Nancy Pelosi said this last weekend, I heard her say it, and it, it really did sum it up for me. She said, diversity is strength, unity is power. Um, and I truly believe that about the Trojan family. We need the diversity. That is what gives us our edge. Uh, that's what makes us successful. Uh, that's what makes it different. And um, I'm not the biologist on the stage, but I think I'm correct in saying that, you know, from a developmental point of view, the more diverse an ecosystem you have, usually the better in terms of its resilience, its vitality. And I really believe that's true in social ecosystems. And so I think you have to really make the entire organization know you are better together than apart. That doesn't mean you don't recognize kind of the distinct kind of strengths of each group and you let people have identification uh, with areas and people that they feel good about. But really what you want to do is make people feel like you are in it together. Um, and again, I think Carol has done an extraordinarily good job at that in terms of the university community and even the student centers that you saw. The whole idea is to make people feel interconnected. They want to have their own safe spaces and people that they can identify with, but the real power when you go into those student centers and into the USC community uh, is when, again, people want to be together. They want to know about people that are different than them, not just people that are like them. Fantastic. I'm going to use that uh, unity as power. 
because in terms of diversity, you tend to get diverse and you get to diverge, but that's not where you want to go with diversity. You want to make sure you're creating unity. So let me ask you the same question, Carol. Um, yeah, as a I, leader, how do you create a unified community? Well, I love, I mean, I actually really love that, that whole concept because unity also does not mean that we're all the same. Those are not opposites, diversity and unity. And that's what I think is the really big mistake, is that people think a diverse community can't work because you're not going to all agree. But the truth is, a diverse community works if you all believe that you don't all have to agree and that your unity is about creating a place where people can disagree and work together, uh, make change, uh, listen to difference, change when needed, you know, all of that. So those are actually very compatible. So I think that's where you're trying to work with people is find these, these unifying values that are about how we act, not what we look like or what we specifically stand for. It's how we treat each other. How do we try to make more people available to solve these problems? So, you know, I think the moonshots were in a way important unifiers for us because you didn't have to pick and choose. I don't believe in computers, you know. <laughs> I don't want people to want to come here. You know, I don't want to have, you know, so we have moonshots around areas of excellence that everyone knows are important. So when you start having that, and, and your first one is about creating an environment for everyone to thrive and be successful, it's both human and it's aspirational. So where we've been successful, I think it's when we found those points of, of leverage that could really advance our mission. You know, not everyone agrees with everything you do. Even when I put in the 80,000 for tuition, that wasn't necessarily uniformly appreciated. Um, I think everyone would like everything to be free if you could, but there are trade-offs that go with every decision. So we don't always have to everyone believe that the decision was the one they would make, but there was enough agreement and everyone that was in a position to make that work was unified. We've made that decision. Now we're going to make it work. That's when I think we feel like we can really march forward. Fantastic. Let me shift gears a little bit here. Um, so traditionally, you know, diversity programs, uh, especially with respect to gender, focused on making women more like men. Uh, that women had to be more like men. Um, and certainly that's, you know, not the power as, as well. So, you know, my, my wife, um, Eva, out there. Um, Eva, where are you? There you go. I love you. <laughs> But, uh, you know, she just retired after 40 years of being a manager at uh, UPS and FedEx. So, big male do <laughs> you know, male-dominated male industries. Um, but she said, you know, I didn't have to be a man. I wanted to be a woman and took advantage of the fact that I was a woman in, in, in what she did. So I'm curious for the two of you, um, how have you used the fact of being a woman to your advantage in your leadership? You know, I, I think these are, are, are um, issues that are changing with time. You know, when I was first starting out, and I'm a woman in science, in my graduate program I was the only woman with 15 male scientists. It, it was not the same world that you see now. But what I realized very early on is I wasn't going to be a male, <laughs> you know, I was a female scientist. And, you know, at that moment, when you first start realizing you can't possibly do the thing that everybody else is doing, when you find the fun in not being that, it's really good. So difference, and I'm talking to a room of people, I know you have all experienced this in your own way, but your difference can actually be very positive for you. I didn't have to sound like my male colleagues when I was talking. I didn't have to dress like them. And, it, and so as I got more confident about those decisions, it became one of my greatest points of joy. But what I think I learned, the biggest thing I did learn once I had more and more of these positions is that I had an opportunity to tell, you know, when you start moving into positions where you're up in front of people or you're carrying more and more authority, I started realizing that I had the ability to empower other people to realize they didn't have to do it too. That's when it became really joyful. 
And, you know, I remember my first, uh, when I was uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences at Dartmouth, and I'd run these meetings, and we said, anybody that gets a phone call between three and five from their kids gets to walk right out of the room and go answer the phone. It was such a liberating moment for the men and the women in that field. And there'd be more and more things that you could do all the time that really changed. I, I mean, they'd be goofy things, but I remember the first time I decided to wear a skirt instead of a suit, which I now like to wear suits, but I used to like to wear skirts. But, you know, it was just that I found that when I did it once, anybody could feel they could do it forever. That is immense. It's much more powerful to get to be the different person than the same person. That's kind of where I'd start seeing it, and so it ceased being such an issue for me, yet clearly in, you know, there are areas where it's still important, but now I get to fight for everybody else, not so much for myself, and that's always much more satisfying, too. Thank you. And Suzanne? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Suzanne, you were in investment banking, and now you run our board. How have you used being a woman to your advantage? So, so, like Carol, I probably was a generation where there was no other women in the room, uh, which in many ways uh, could actually be an advantage, too, uh, because, believe me, uh, you know, you were noticed. So if you're the only one there, and it, it doesn't matter whether I was in seventh grade in my research labs in science, it was the only girl, so you just got used to it. But I, I think women do have an advantage, uh, at least for now, it is only women who are physically giving birth, um, and they're giving birth uh, to basically both genders. Um, and so I think women have a particular appreciation um, uh, about what the strengths and weaknesses are. And I'll, I'll give you a test that I had. When I first made partner, they sent you to an orientation, and there weren't very many women in the orientation obviously, um, and one of the tests that they gave you is, was the Ernie and Bert test. Does everyone know who Ernie and Bert is? Um, so the two men who were running the firm were Steve and Bob, and you were given a test of, of if Ernie and Bert were having a birthday party for your child, would you opt for that or if Bob and Steve had said there was a mandatory meeting? And so I'm in a group with only men having to answer this question in the orientation. And it was clear to me, and, and by the way, I don't have kids, but I have a huge extended family. And so to me, it wasn't even a close call. Ernie and Bert were going to win. Um, um, and I realized if I said Ernie and Bert, I would give permission to my male colleagues to talk about family. And I'm sure Carol will attest to this. At that point, no men talked about, you know, balanced lifestyle, you know, helping the family. That was kind of viewed as not guy guy. Um, and so it was incredibly liberating to realize that you had incredible power um, to give other people, you know, the freedom to think a little bit more broadly. I love that, Suzanne. I'm going to jump in again because I think that that's really true. And when I've talked about being able to talk about what women could wear and do things like that, like that, the first thing I did both as chancellor at UNC and president here is to say to my male colleagues, you don't have to wear ties. And uh, that was very popular at the moment as well. You know, but it is true. We can say things that some of our male colleagues can't. We, you know, and I think for probably both Suzanne and for me, there were, we had to turn our back on a lot of bad stuff said and done, and that was part of the coming through. And now, I do think we try pretty hard to help people not to go through that, but there is your own building of your own strength and your own character, you know, and you do learn a lot when you're changing things. Pioneers have incredible um, opportunity that goes with that, and what I think it's important for you to realize is that in many things that you'll do, whether you're not you're the first woman or the first, is you're going to be a pioneer because you're bringing in another new perspective. So that opportunity of different or pioneering is actually quite an advantage, and it plays out in your career over and over again. And, and if you've all seen, if you have purpose and mission, there's nothing scary about being pioneering. You know, it's incredibly powerful. And I think you just have to kind of keep that mindset in whatever you do. Fantastic. 
Um, and I, I'd say the same thing on, on my uh, my respect. Um, I was the first Asian American to serve on the board of uh, my, my law firm. I'm actually the first Asian American to serve in the role as uh, leading uh, the alumni association. So you know, you just be, you be a pioneer and and you embrace that and, and lead. So in our remaining time, I want to make sure we uh, save some time for the question Q and A that uh, came through the uh, conference app. Um, we've got many great questions, and I'll try to get to as many as I can. Um, so first question that came through our app was, uh, what would be different, if anything, if there were more women in leadership positions? To either of you. Uh, you know, I'll just kind of quickly, I mean, I think we have a lot of women in leadership positions here. I think we're seeing what it looks like. It's a very balanced group. Um, women do bring forward sometimes first, things about family work-life balance, but not always. So I just think what you'll see as you get to, if you even achieved parity or it, sometimes you end up with more women, you do tend to see a balance between not only presenting your professional interests, but allowing for the wholly integrated person. And who doesn't want that for their partner and their children, male or female? We want everyone to feel that, but women tend to be very open to more of that. But you know, you can't generalize about women either. But I think you see that as we've come forward. Suzanne, your thoughts? I think the one thing that I would love to see is there's more women leaders, is us, a lot of women and a lot of women of color knew what it meant to be excluded. They felt it very personally. Uh, they saw it in specific situations. And there's a lot of groups today that I think we wouldn't have considered to be excluded groups who feel very excluded. They don't feel like they're a part of the party. They don't know what the language is. They don't know what the sensibility is. Um, and I think to the extent there's more women leaders and we can remember the legacy of what being excluded feels like uh, and doing everything we can uh, to make sure everyone around the table feels good and feels a part of it and can communicate to one another. It's so good. I'm going to throw another one in because I think that's really good. Women also do grow up much more often connected in community. And that, I think, really helps us um, GSD get shit done. And I do see that in a lot of women leaders. <laughs> Absolutely. i got to remember that one, too. <laughs> Um, so let me say how, you know, the topic of this, uh, this session is uh, having a seat at the table. Um, so how should women use your seat at the table you know, going forward, this position of power? Suzanne, you want to start? Sure. I mean, first of all, and the very simple, I think being an example uh, and being a guardian and a custodian for the values of whatever organization you're sitting around the table, whether it's your family table, whether it's a board table, whether it's the president's leadership table, uh, it really is uh, being an exemplar of what the values are that you want to have represented. Um, and I think uh, being a guardian and a custodian of, you know, again, doing that. And then I would say being an advocate for other people at the table. Um, you know, many of us over the years have had different kinds of advocates, um, some women, some men, some in between, uh, and I actually think being an advocate for others around the table is quite, quite important. Absolutely. Carol? It's just wonderful. You have this, you have to remember that it's all leadership is fleeting, and it isn't really about I mean, people always want you to say what your legacy is. I really don't like that question at all because I think it puts a focus on the wrong thing. The important thing is using your moments when you have them to advance the things you believe in, to help the people that you want to see flourish, and be prepared at any moment to know that's it and the next person takes over. It's about the work that you do, not the legacy you create. And when you do that, it's so incredibly fleeting, freeing, because it's about living in that moment and going for something really good. And that, that's how I try to really live it. And the concept of just being great allies, the concept, mm -hmm. you know, um, I can ask this from time to time, and an ally means a lot of different things. You could be a mentor, you could be a sponsor, like you were saying, um, you could be an advocate, 
You could be a, a champion. You could be a confidant. Um, you could be an, a person to speak up for somebody. Uh, you can be, uh, you know, so many different things when it says to be an ally. So there's so many different roles that we can play um, and using that, that seat at the table. Um, final question is, um, again, speaking of uh, the seat at the table, what, what is the most important seat at the table? And what, and what, what makes that, uh, is, it, is there always the same most important seat at the table? So I'm going to give it, I probably could answer this differently many different ways, but I'm going to say in a way it's the person not at the table is the most important seat at the table. So I would put there students. So they don't sit at the table. I'd put there my community. I, I do actually think it's easy to say that and it's hard to do it, but I really do think that is really important. And in all the things Suzanne was saying and you were saying, if you're really acutely aware of all the people not sitting at the table, then you're much more likely not to make decisions that are too quick or gonna cause you bad consequences. So, you know, I don't go so far as to have a symbolic empty seat. Some people do it, but I do think it's the, the empty seat in a way. Fantastic. Suzanne? So, so I completely agree with Carol. Uh, not a surprise, I really do. But let me tell you the other seat at the table that has become more and more important to me. In every table you're at generally, especially in a context of an institution, there are other people in the room, but they're not at the table. And if you really understand those people and get their feedback, they give you incredible insight into what you're missing or what message has been sent. And I wanted to give you just a, an example that I had with this um, a couple months ago that just blew me away. So um, something, another organization I spend time with is called Brookings, which is a think tank in Washington. And Ben Bernanke was doing a presentation and a speech um, in this beautiful museum in Washington. I can't even remember which one. And um, I had snuck out the wrong door and so um, there was a custodial staff that was appropriately trying to string me up and say, you can't leave. And so we got to talking. And they said to me, can you explain what Ben Bernanke said? Because we really want to be able to apply that to our lives, to our jobs. And so I ended up staying for kind of two and a half hours after everyone was gone. I did get to go out the wrong door, luckily. <laughs> it was worth it. Um, but we spent two and a half hours, and I realized that conversation was the most profound conversation because they were talking about tabletop issues that were incredibly important. And by the way, as you walked through kind of the Ben Bernanke discussion, they absolutely understood and it gave them a way to really connect the dots, which is really hard to do, I think, in our world generally today, given how complicated things are, how difficult they are. Um, so I think the people in the room, uh, but not at the table, are incredibly important uh, people. That's wonderful. Fantastic. Yeah. And I just want to give up another tactical uh, thing that Suzanne, in, in the board meetings, when she runs the board meetings, at the end of each meeting, she'll actually go around the table and ask everyone at the table, do they have anything else to add? And you know that we have some people that are extroverts that love to you know, say things and contribute all the time, but some of us are introverts, and maybe you don't feel as comfortable you know, sharing those things. And Suzanne does that at the, at the end of every board meeting. She says, goes around the room, so anything that you wanted to say that you didn't get a chance to say, it's having those people feeling like they have a seat at the table. So thank you for doing that, Suzanne. Uh, so I just want to thank all of you for submitting the questions through the app. Um, there are some great, great questions. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to them all. But uh, you've been a great, great uh, audience. And I just want to thank again President Folt and Suzanne Nora Johnson for joining us here today. And, and John, Carol and I want to thank you. You did an amazing job. And uh, Eva, you chose well. <laughs> <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce the final speaker for our morning program. Tracy Arsissi is market executive within Bank of America's Global Commercial Bank. 
In this position, she leads a team of finance professionals who support the wide-ranging needs of companies with annual revenues from $50 million to $2 billion. Throughout her career, Tracy has been recognized for her extraordinary work. The LA Business Journal named her a 2024 Women of Influence in Finance. <laughs> Tracy is also passionate about supporting mentoring programs. She joins us now to discuss how and why mentors are important and how sponsors are essential for women to succeed in the workplace. Please welcome Tracy Arcisi. Thank Thanks very much. Well, good morning, uh, women of the USC Women's Conference. It's great to be here this morning. Uh, I'm personally very proud to be here for a lot of reasons, but mentorship and sponsorship have played such an important role in my life personally. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about that with you today. And as well, I get the opportunity to work for a bank that truly embraces the power of mentorship and sponsorship, especially for women, which is fantastic as we kick off Women's History Month today, so, all right. And just one example I wanted to share with you about how Bank of America really embraces this for women is our Lead for Women Employee Network. We have some of our lead leaders here today. Can I get a shout out from our lead leaders? There we go. So LEAD is all about, it's all about connecting, developing, and elevating women, in part through the use of mentorship and sponsorship. We have 45,000 members across the bank. That's almost 20% of our global workforce belongs to LEAD. Think about that commitment to mentorship, sponsorship, and elevating women. That's pretty amazing. I'm really proud to be a part of it. So, with that, let's talk about mentorship and sponsorship. I'm gonna level set a little bit here and just give you a couple of key background factoids about me. Maybe that helps you understand some of the stories I wanna tell you this morning. Uh, number one, I started my career 24 years ago. And just a quick side note to a mentor of mine who called me out in a meeting a couple of years ago. She caught me kind of downplaying uh, my, the, the, the length of time I'd been in my career, kind of like, oh, you know, 20 something years, or I don't even want to say how long it's been. And she was like, why would you do that? You, you earned it, you own it. I mean, people can figure out how old you are. It's not that big of a deal. A guy certainly, <laughs> certainly wouldn't care about that. So, so you earn it, you own it. So it's 24 years that I've been uh, in my career. In that time, I've worked for five companies and I've had 11 different roles. And now simple math is going to tell you that uh, 24 years, 11 different roles, on average, I had been staying about a little over two years in each role. That's moving pretty quickly. That's gonna come up again here in just a second. On a real quick personal note, I have a wonderful husband who makes me laugh every day. Uh, my mama's heart is very happy because my stepson just moved from New York to Northern California, so he's close to home, and I'm also a dog mom for all of you fur parents out there. Yeah, Winnie the Chocolate Lab. She's gorgeous, but she's really not very well mannered. So, um, <laughs> so mentorship and sponsorship has been a part of my career throughout. Um, and let's just think for a minute, what is a mentor? A mentor is a coach, it's a trusted advisor, it's a guide, it's somebody who's kind of cheering you on along the way. And I wanna just hear a quick, give me a woo-hoo if you are either currently benefiting from a mentor or you are a mentor yourself. Who's out there being active right now? All right, all right, so we've got it down. My job is done, we can go to lunch. Just kidding, just kidding. Just, it won't, we, we'll, we'll get through it though. Uh, so mentorship, what, what does a mentor do? What do you do as a mentor? You're coaching, you're helping, you're empowering. Uh, you're doing a lot of different things and that's one of the beauties of mentorship along the course of your career, along the course of your life, really, uh, it can change. What you need from it changes, what you get from it changes. You have the power to ask for and identify what you need from other people um, and work with them along the way. One of the most powerful ways a mentor has worked with me uh, is by being a mirror and holding up some information for me, letting me, making me see myself in a way that I didn't necessarily want to see but it was a really important message for me to get at that point in, in my career. That was mentor, we're gonna call him Bill because that's actually his name. Um, he, was my, he, was, he was my boss in role number five. 
And he was one of those guys who instinctively, one of those people that just instinctively knows what to do, and he was almost, he was almost always right. I learned a lot from him, but true to, again, 24 years, 11 different roles, I had moved right along. I'm moving along. I'm already fast forward to rule number seven, and I'm stuck. I had failed to do the diligence that I needed to really make sure I was a fit for the organization. I didn't really understand what I was supposed to be contributing, and I just, I wasn't in a good spot. And I thought, I'll call Bill. He always knows what to do. So I called Bill, and I said, I really need your help. Could you help me think through this? I'm really kind of stuck, and I'm not sure what to do. And it was almost like he was expecting my call. He knew me that well. He said, I'm happy to help, but what happens when someone says but? You expect great things, right? You just, you're so excited. What are you going to say next? So uh, you know, there was part of me that thought, <laughs> Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I like this. And he, he continued and he said, but I'm going to tell you some things that you're not going to want to hear. You're not going to like them. And, and there was a part of me at that point that thought, you know what, Bill, I'm good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'll be fine. Um, but, I, but thankfully, another part of me won out that day and I, you know, I trusted Bill, which I think is a really key point when we think about messages we get from mentors and how important they are. Sometimes they're giving us things that we don't want to hear. His message for me was, you move along way too quickly. You don't give anybody the chance to see what exactly you can do and how your skills really benefit an organization. Nobody is going to give you a bigger job or promote you up if you just flit around and get bored and move along every couple of years. It's just not going to happen. And that was really hard for me to hear because it, it forced me to own the opportunity cost of my choices. And think about that. It's not that I didn't have the skill. It's not that any of us don't have the skill. Sometimes we just make the wrong decision. So I was the one holding me back. And that was really hard to hear. But it was really important for me to hear. And, and it was also important to hear it from someone like Bill, someone whom I trusted. I was in a spot right then that I wouldn't have trusted that message coming from my direct manager. Sometimes that's an important role that mentors play too. Uh, they're, they're the voice outside of your day to day that carries a little more weight. And so keeping Bill's words in mind, I moved on to find where I belonged. Uh, and I did. I found Bank of America. And I'm, I'm really thrilled to say I've been there for almost eight years now. Uh, I feel like I've really found a home. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I think that's my Bank of America crowd speaking up there. Um, uh, but anyway, but, but to be honest with you, I got off to kind of a rocky start. Um, and I'm going to pause there for just a quick sec. So one of the, one of the ways that uh, mentors can help in lots of different ways. Sometimes they uplift you. Sometimes they're helping you grow your confidence. Sometimes they're helping you maybe with technical skills. It's really up to you to decide where do I need help? What would I like the power to do? Uh, if any of you have heard any Bank of America ads over the course of the past three years, you may have heard that question asked before. What would you like the power to do? And think about that. Ask yourself that question. What, what would you like the power to do? It helps you get really, really clear. It makes you think, right? It does. It's powerful. So fast forward, I'm at Bank of America. I got off to kind of a rocky start. Uh, wasn't a great fit with my first manager. Didn't feel very welcome for a lot of different reasons. And, and I think it was Suzanne had said, I was in the room, but I didn't have a seat at the table. And that was really challenging for me. And so I, I looked around me and I tried to identify someone who, who knew the organization better than I did and who had some of the skills that I thought I needed. And at that point, I thought what I needed was learning how to better navigate a really large organization and figuring out where else I might be able to contribute and fit in. And I found Matt. Uh, Matt is still an executive with the bank today. He's, he's done a number of different things with the bank, but he's done so not in the I'm flitting around and bored and so I'm going to move on to the next thing way, the Tracy way, or at least the old Tracy way. Uh, he was doing it in the Matt way. He was doing it a really great job. He was kind of a problem solver. I reached out to him and said, Matt, would you please spend some time with me? I'd really like to learn about how better to navigate the organization from you. He said, absolutely, I'm happy to do it. Most mentors do that. Most, most people, when you ask them for help, they say yes. Um, and we spent some time together, and one of the really important things he did for me and with me is he really asked that question. What, what is this really about? What would you really like the power to do? And the time we spent together, he helped me get really, really intentional about thinking about how my skills overlay in the organization and where I could contribute more impactfully. He was, he got me thinking also really intentional then about, or intentionally about how could I take 
my skills and start making connections with people who were in places where I wanted to be or I had, interested, or had interest in being. Uh, and it was an amazing thing. And more importantly, he gave me confidence. He helped me build my own confidence. And that's another key thing that mentors do, both as mentors and mentees. It's a confidence builder. We're saying, we're saying, hey, I trust you enough, I admire you enough that I wanna spend time with you and learn from you. This is a very important person and they're saying, I'm willing to spend time with you. That makes you a very important person too, as a mentee and as a mentor, how great does it feel to have someone saying, I wanna learn from you and having that opportunity to serve and give back. Mentorship is amazing. So with Matt's help, a few months later, a new job opened up in a role that I was, I was really excited about. It was a bit of a stretch role for me. It was a different line of business. I had the opportunity to take it, and I did, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And, um, and I just cannot say enough about the power of mentorship and, and how it's influenced my career. And we're gonna, we're gonna recap on mentorship here in a minute, but let's pivot for a sec and talk about sponsorship. It's a little bit different than mentorship. Um, well, I guess, real pausing real quick, straw poll, who, who watched the Apple Music Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago? Anyone, did anyone watch the Super Bowl? Yeah. Right? Did, did anyone notice Apple Music had their name on it? It was, I, yeah, I mean, that's a sponsor, right? Uh, someone who's willing to put their stamp on something. Now, in that case, Apple probably paid a lot of money to do that. We generally don't pay our sponsors um, in a professional context. I guess I should pause here. More importantly, who was rooting for Taylor Swift in the Super Bowl? Okay. All right. Now I've got. Now, now we're on the same page. So, so when I when I think about what a sponsor is, there's someone who's going to speak up for you when you're not in the room. It's somebody who may take a more active role in helping you find and get that next opportunity. And most importantly, and this is my tie-in with my Super Bowl thing, um, if there's someone who's gonna put their stamp of approval on you. They're gonna vouch for you. They're going to say, this, this person has, I trust this person, you should trust them too. And that's really one of the reasons why I'm standing here today and in job number 11, which is my absolute favorite. My role today is that of a market executive. I work in our global commercial bank, which means I get the privilege of leading a team of super talented bankers who they wake up every day and their sole focus is making financial lives better for the companies that we serve. And I'm really proud of that and I'm so happy to be in that role. And I'm in that role because I had a sponsor or a mentor who turned into a sponsor uh, a little while back. Her name was Rita, her name is Rita. And, um, and I worked in her organization. She wasn't my immediate boss. There was a layer in between us, but I had worked on some special projects with her. She had gotten to know me. She had seen my work, so she was in a position to sponsor me. And this role came up in Los Angeles, and she said, you should go for it. I said, I, I'm excited to go for it. I'm gonna go for it. And uh, I called the hiring manager. Her name is Karen. And spoiler alert, she is my boss today, so the story does have a happy ending, thankfully. Um, and we had a great conversation, or at least what I thought was a great conversation about what she was looking to do and adding to her leadership team and important characteristics um, that, uh, that she needed from, from, from a leader in that role. And I thought it was going great. And then at the end, she said something that could have been really deflating. In fact, it was very deflating uh, to me at the time, or rather I allowed it to be. She said, you know, I'm really happy that you are interested in this role. However, I've got a slate as long as my arm of really qualified candidates. Um, so just know that competition is going to be incredibly, incredibly fierce. And it was kind of an awkward way to end the conversation, right? You're like, <laughs> like thanks, uh, bye. <laughs> and, um, and I took that back to Rita and I said, you know, I'm still gonna go for it, but I am, I'm kind of, I'm kind of bummed. And she said, stop, stop. Okay, get out of your head. Number one, I have absolute confidence in you and your capabilities. What a great mentor. How empowering is that, right? Um, and she said number two, and this is where she really flipped the switch and became clearly a sponsor for me. She said, in fact, I'm so convinced of this and I'm so confident in you. I'm gonna pick up the phone and I'm gonna call Karen and I just, I just wanna make sure she knows the Tracy I see, the skills you bring to your job every day here and how that translates and how beneficial that would be for her as part of her leadership team. And she did that, and here I am. 
And I don't know what better, thank you, thank you. I, I'm not sure there could be, at least personally, a better plug for sponsorship and mentorship that I, someone like me gets to share the stage with everyone else that we've seen here this morning and to be here with all of you. That is incredibly powerful. Um, I'm, 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 just, I'm just thrilled. Um, so we, we kind of think about what, what is our power in terms of embracing mentorship and sponsorship in our careers and navigating our careers. I think it's, I think it's a number of things. It's that idea that mentors can be different things to you at different times, and it's really up to you to determine what do you need and who, and who are you gonna go get it from. You can always make the ask. It is always within our power to make the ask. I've talked a lot about mentors who are more senior people, mentoring more junior people. It doesn't always have to be the case. It often is, but it's not always the case. Uh, peer mentors can be incredibly powerful. In fact, I use those on my team all the time. So uh, my bankers can learn from each other's strengths. It's incredibly powerful. I have a peer mentor here in Los Angeles. She's the CEO of an industrial cleaning company, and we're working together to learn how better to be influential in our communities in an authentic way, as well as in our business communities. And it's really exciting. We're having a lot of fun together. We're learning a lot from each other. Um, and it's just fun to have a buddy to hang out with. So um, as you think about how you use mentorship and sponsorship in your career, mentorship is a little more of a direct path, right? You have that absolute power to say, I, I want to learn from you. I'm going to make that ask. From a sponsor, you may not know always who your sponsors are, but using mentors tend to be a long-term developer of sponsors, Staying in touch with your managers and other people of influence whom you know in an organization can be incredibly helpful in that way. Staying in touch and keep, keeping colleagues updated as they move on can also be a great way to develop a field of sponsors. And I guess I will leave you with this. Before we get to lunch here, um, I just wish you every success as you think about how you can use mentorship and sponsorship uh, to drive and navigate your career forward. And I do hope to get to chat with many of you this afternoon. So thank you very much. Please welcome back Amy Carter. So hi everyone, we hope you thoroughly enjoyed our morning program. There's so much more to come. But first things first, please join us in Alumni Park for lunch and a chance to connect with old friends and make new ones. After lunch, the first round of breakout sessions will begin at 1.30, followed by the second round at 2.25. Please check the Women's Conference for more information about our programs and locations. And if you need any assistance, please ask one of our committee members or a USC Alumni Association staff member. Members and staff, please wave your hands. Audience. Um, and one more thing of housekeeping, if you have not checked in yet, please be sure to do that before lunch. So have fun, and we'll see you soon.